This episode, I'm going to ask you to be nice. Until it's time to not be nice. That's right. This week, we're going to look at the first 10 pages of Roadhouse. Written by Hilary Henkin, based on material by R. Lance Hill. So let's take a look at the first 10 pages of Roadhouse here. 124-page screenplay about a bouncer. Somebody asked me, they said, what's Roadhouse about? And I said, he's a bouncer. And they said, I, I, I got that, but what is it about? And I said, okay, yeah, he's a bouncer at a bar. A guy comes in, says, hey, you're a really good bouncer. Do you want to be a bouncer at my bar? And he says, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And then he becomes a bouncer at that bar. And that's the movie. There's some fighting, some stabbing, some uh, ripping throats out. But that's it. He's a bouncer. He's a cooler. So let's take a look here at the first 10 of Roadhouse, which I love the fact that it's written by a woman. Who, who knew that coming into this episode? That Roadhouse was written by a woman. Right away, something that we don't see too often here. It's almost like a cover page. <laughs> it's almost a resume here. Uh, Dalton has a degree in psychology from NYU. He drives a new Mercedes. His entire worldly goods fit easily into the trunk. He carries his x-rays and medical records with him. He keeps in superb, superb condition a body that has been shot and stabbed and had more than 30 bones broken and has been screwed back together by an impressive array of stainless steel screws. He has already worked in almost half the states in the Union. He makes a lot of money. He is the best there is at what he does. He is a bouncer. He is the best there is at what he does. That was a Chris Jericho catchphrase for a little bit. I am the best in the world at what I do. And I wonder if that son of a bitch (laughs) got it from here. I don't know if that's in the movie. I don't think it is. And I don't. I'd have to doubt the fact that Chris Jericho would read the Roadhouse screenplay. But I'm going to imagine he did, and that's where he got that little catchphrase. But very unique, very unique cover page here, and just straight up introducing the the character. And that's great. Like, that's all we need to know. That is a character introduction. It's a a little lengthy, but it's stylized. And Hillary's going to do some stylized things throughout the first 10 pages here that uh, I personally enjoy. Let's take a look here. Roadhouse. Fade in. Uh, Outside the arsenal in Atlanta, Georgia. Night. And, oh boy. Right away. I mean, and and this is just, this is just part of it. When you're introducing a world and characters, it's sometimes there's a lot of description. So we're going to get through it here. An enormous place situated on the edge of town. The club is built from something that looks like an old warehouse or airplane hangar. In keeping with the times, the abandoned body of a WW2 jet has been painted, hung with neon, stands directly in front of the entrance to the place, which is surrounded by a sea of parked cars. A lineup snakes from the door into the lot, which is jammed to the gills. It's only 10 p.m., and already the place is sizzling, filled to capacity. The parking lot's wall-to-wall with a testament to the new materialism. BMWs, Jags alongside of the usual sedans and pickup trucks. Loud, raucous, backbeat-driven rock and roll emanates from the club, booms out over the lot. The arsenal used to be a funky country-western roadhouse, the type of place that averaged more than a couple of casualties a night, blood on the floor, brawls out in the parking lot. Not anymore. Inside the arsenal, jammed wall-to-wall, the place is incendiary with raw energy. The band does hot rock and roll laced with Cajun funk. Oh my lord, this is a Steven Seagal movie. The bar is in overdrive. The crowd is sleek, dressed to impress, anxious to flash expensive watches, uh, Amex cards, whatever they're holding at the moment. Anything that'll get them laid with the right person. So we are really just setting the scene of the arsenal here. And whatever kind of place the arsenal started out as, it's been tamed into submission for the moment. Now it's got a richer clientele and a wine list. In general, it's every restauranteur's dream. A second chance at raking in the bucks. A new lease on life. Now, I do like this introduction. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of it is history and lore that we can't really see. Like, unless we see a picture of what the arsenal used to look like, and it looked like shit, and now it looks great. You can't really see that. Uh, It's great information on the page, though, but 
on the screen. I just don't know if that's going to come across. Uh, on the bar, the bartenders are consummate pros. The waitresses are quick, friendly. The half dozen bouncers without jackets are in constant movement, shifting through the crowd, barely discernible. One gets the feeling that all the curious, curiously understated control of the Arsenal's patrons, hence its new upscale image and financial success, emanates from one person, and that one person is Dalton. As he leans into his customary shadow near the bar, sneakers, jeans, loose-fitting shirt, nothing happens in here he doesn't see or sense or anticipate the crowd into the music, clapping, dancing, shaking great bodies, three guys at a table. Pussy prospectors. <laughs> they, they have a side propped on the table offering free mustache rides. Now, before we get into this, you're going to see that she transitions to certain places inside a room uh, with these mini slug lines. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I like it quite a bit. It's, it's, it's an easy transition. You know what we're supposed to be focusing on because we've seen your know, camera pans up and focuses on Dalton. Just th- th- Dalton, like that's like we're good. We got there. So big thumbs up on that. I do like that. So let's go back. Uh, let's go back up here to the Pussy Prospectors. Uh, one of the guys tries hitting on a definitely upscale girl as she moves past them. Hi, I'm an unemployed missionary. Know where I might find a missionary position? She looks him over, mulls over whether she's into slumming it for the night. Then, that the only position you're interested in? That a skill testing question? She likes his line. She sits, music up. Boy, oh boy, the 80s, huh? A lot, lot easier back then. Outside the arsenal, the bouncer on the door succumbs to the pleas from the two women and admits, admits them from... Outside the arsenal, the bouncer on the door succumbs to the pleas from two women and admits them from the lineup. As an airport limo pulls up, from it steps Tillman, a man in his 50s with something on his mind. He exchanges a few clipped words with the bouncer, shows a business card, and is allowed inside. Another bouncer tries to find some place to seat the two women, but he can't. He trolls them past the table with the three mustaches. The women read the offer. They sit down. The grins beneath the mustaches turn to shit-eating smiles. Let's focus on the band, who winds up its number to raucous appreciation, wet themselves down from standby beers, and head right into another driving number. Dalton gets his ever-present coffee refilled by one of the bartenders, winds his way through the press of bodies toward the front door. At a table, two women sit alone, getting off on the music. A pair of hard-nosed dudes pull up chairs uninvited, you ladies for fun or profit what do you come for free or does it cost go fuck your fist (laughs) this screenplay is great this screenplay is amazing i don't care what anyone says this is 124 pages of solid gold and we're only going to look at the first 10 so you got to read the, the last 114 pages on your own, and you been you better. Hard nose two drops a hundred dollar bill on the table. Woman two pierces it with the metal nail file she's been using and flicks it back. Okay, ain't no big thing. Dropping her eyes to his to his crotch. <laughs> I can see that. Got he, oh, Got his ass. Got his ass. A hundred dollar bill though. God damn. It is, a, it is an upscale joint. Pissed, hard-nosed number one puts his shoe on her chair and sends her over backwards in a jumble of skirt, legs, panties. Tillman steps from the owner's office, the owner behind him. The owner indicates he might want to watch how this gets handled. Two bouncers move in. Number one up front, number two behind. Bouncer number one, easy bud. Easy, easy buddy. Hard-nosed one rocks him back with a straight arm to the chest. Bouncer 2 clamps his arms around Hard Nose 1 from behind, pinning his arms vice-like, ready to duck-walk him to the door. Lighten up, man. You need some air is all. Hard Nose 1 decks him. Two more bouncers move in. The band knows better than to stop playing, but they exchange knowing glances, eyes following movement across the floor. Their POV, Dalton. So they see him. They say, oh, there he is. 
Oh, there's Mr. Swayze. Oh, someone's about to get fucked up. He steps up to the fringe. It's a momentary standoff, the bouncers following his standing directive that it never happens inside unless, unless there is no other way. Hardnose One locks his sneer on Dalton. How about it, Dalton? I always wanted to try you. No thanks. I think maybe I can take you. Maybe you can. That's not my job. He nods to the bouncers to get them out, starts to turn away. Hardnose One scoops the nail file from the table and slashes, catching him along the ribs. It takes two bouncers to restrain Hard Nose One. You and me, Dalton. Dalton knows he's been cut, has no need of feelings or seeing the blood. More resignation than anything else, he nods and indicates the Hard Noses precede him. The crowd crushes in to follow. Tillman follows. But at the door, as soon as the Hard Noses are through it, Dalton turns and walks away. Um, and that's how it happens in, in, in the movie as well, I believe. Outside, the hard noses realize that Dalton has done a number on them, and four of the bouncers are lined across the door. Tillman is impressed. The band hasn't missed a beat. The place smoothly shifts back to normal. So, yeah, that's what happens in the movie. Uh, he gets cut. I don't remember if it was a nail file. I think it was just a blade, but the truth is up there. Uh, and then he's, I want to try it. Let's go outside. And he's like, yeah, all right. And then when he gets the bad guys outside, he's like, okay, you're outside now. That's all I wanted. Goodbye. <laughs> and so he kind of tricks them a little bit. So that is all in the movie. And back inside the arsenal, Dalton waits while one of the bartenders boils water. Tillman walks up. Talk to you a minute. What about? Working for me. Dalton takes uh, the carafe of boiling water. Tillman follows him to the employee washroom. Dalton disinfects the cut, uh, fishes a suture needle from the carafe with a pair of surgical clamps and commences with the first of four neat practiced stitches. Tillman has never before seen anyone sew themselves up and finds it excruciating to watch. Dalton's glance says, so talk. Name's Tillman. I got a place outside Kansas City called the Double Deuce. I've heard of it. Well, I got some trouble. It used to be sweet, now it's the kind of joint you sweep up eyeballs after closing. Sounds familiar. I came into some money. I want to make a little better life for myself. I need somebody to help me clean the place up. I need the best. Wade Garrett's the best. Garrett's getting old. Yeah, but he's still the best. Yeah, well, I want you, Dalton. 5000 up front and 200 a night. Cash, legal tender, and all medical expenses. Tillman counts out 5000 I'm an independent contractor. When the job's done, I walk. I got some tickets. We can leave for the airport as soon as you're done for the night. Planes scare me. I'll get there. I'm scared. I'll, I will walk there. Tillman starts for the door, hesitates. I, uh, I thought you'd be bigger. Which, that... That's, we, man, how many movies have we done that I thought you'd be bigger? And you know what? I'm a sucker for it every time. A sucker for it every damn time. I think the Snake Plissken got, gets hit with that. Yeah, you're going to see that one. Credits up and over the following series of quick shots. Exterior, and so we get a little bit of a montage here as he gets ready for his big move because he doesn't like aeroplanes. Um, so he's going to just drive it out. So he goes and gets his stuff. Uh, Mercedes... 560 SUs. I don't know cars. Uh, so super cool car right there for you. And he lives in a hotel. So he's going to get his stuff there. Not a lot. There's not a lot. He has a road sign that warns it is forbidden to throw stones at this sign and a set of Japanese chimes hanging outside the. So just a little bit of a overseas business there. And his Mercedes and the freeway. And the night, uh, here we go. Exterior, Arkansas State Police car, pre-dawn hour, parked partially concealed off the freeway. The uniform is cooping, sleeping. Well, what are we do? What are we doing? What is that about? Just put sleeping then. You know all you you know all the fancy lingo. You, Mark, Hillary, the Merc whistling past snaps him awake. He grabs for the instant on radar, fumbles, drops it. 
By the time he gets it aimed and squeezes the trigger, it's too late. Oh, 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 Mercedes fast. Dalton's fast. Dalton saw the cop, but knows he's clear. Keeps it at 110. Credits continue over as he continues his cool-ass montage. Um, he speaks into the car phone receiver balance, so he's got a fucking car phone in the 80s, the early 80s. That is wild. Um, he's talking to somebody. Yeah, ja- Jasper, Missouri. A house called the Double Deuce. Beat. I told him to get you. <laughs> That's just what he said. So he's talking to uh, his buddy, Garrett. And we do get some beats here, which is just a pause. Um, sometimes in phone conversations, uh, in this, in place of this, uh, folks will just put, you know, listening because they're that's what you're doing you're either talking on a phone call or you're listening um beat works fine here obviously absentmindedly has pulled the rubber ball from his pocket squeezes it while he talks a long pause and then well wade i'm way too old to start chasing women hangs up credits continue over so this montage takes a while here um we get the opening fight he gets hired and we're just we're just fucking driving aren't we Cornfields of the Heartland. Doot, doot, doot. We're going to skip some of uh, this. Jasper, Missouri. Population 10,000. Middle of nowhere. Peaceful. Isolated. Here we go. Exterior parking lot of the Double Deuce. Night. Dalton drives the Mercedes into the lot and parks it. Outside the, the bar. Establish a low sprawling roadhouse. The stars and stripes flies from the roof. Music spills into the half empty parking lot. There is no lineup. Credits end as Dalton pushes the doors to the double deuce open. Stands there. Inside, from his point of view, we see various shots. Yes, we do. It's a zoo! Chicken wire protects the band from thrown bottles and flying bodies. Only half full. Half of those are drunk or high. Half of the half are looking for trouble. And what's left are anxiously thinking of finding a safer place to hang out in. Staff are demoralized, lethargic. Those of the five bouncers who haven't given up entirely are merely going through the motions. A couple are more into connecting with women than keeping the casualty count down. Across the far side of the room at the line of pool tables that runs along the wall there, a full-fledged brawl is going on between competitors. One guy has already passed out on the long staircase that runs up to a balcony on the back wall overlooking the bar. His friends just left him there. The waitresses, in shorts, high heels, and tank tops, are pawed and hit on constantly. The bartenders have a war zone stare. The double deuce is an enterprise out of control. But the band is sensational. Its its lead is Phil Cody, a blind kid who plays from a low stool with a Fender Stratocaster guitar laid flat on his lap. They're wound tight, nearing the end of their set. On wall is a glass jar, and it is a condom. Below it says, break in case of emergency. To which a handwritten addendum clarifies, The jar! The jar! At the bar, a tobacco chewer is using an empty beer bottle for his juice while he enjoys the music. The body, Denise, sits alone at a table up front. She has a dynamite body and nobody knows it better than she does. She crosses to the bar, eating up the attention but coolly ignoring the stream of lines tossed her way. Pat the bartender pours it, takes her money. Pat's a smug, smarmy, dark-haired punk. About 30. The hired help at the Double Deuce seem to stay away from direct contact with the guy whenever possible. A barfly tries his luck on the body. Vodka rocks. What do you say you and me get nipple to nipple? She looks him over. A meat market appraisal. Then guns him off with, I can do that without you. It pisses him off enough that he has to be restrained from following her. He breaks away. A big tough bouncer named Morgan, played by Terry Funk. One of the best wrestlers of all time. Intercepts and slams a fist into his gut. Flings him towards the door. Then pile drives him through a table. The barfly collides roughly with the other patrons. Sprawls. Morgan picks him up. Laughs a crazy laugh. And crashes him through the crowd and out the door. Inside the women's bathroom we see Judy. A waitress. As if on cue she is followed by three women. At a table, Hank, one of the bouncers, blonde, lanky, late 20s, sidles up to run a line on a girl he has singled out. I get off at two. 
And I'd love to get you off about a half hour after that. Waka waka, Hank, you fucking rascal, you. She accepts the pass. Walking away, he shoots a fist in the air like a jock having just thrown a touchdown. That works here? I gotta go to Missouri. Phil Cody is ending the set with an extended riff. Spidery fingers of his courting hand blocking triads and executing flashing lead solos on the fretboard. His picking hand stabbing, wrenching, flailing. The playing brilliant, the sound vintage rock blues, riotous applause follows. The band's audience may be sex-crazed drunks and badasses, but they know their music. A beer bottle sails against the chicken wire, showering them with brew. You're paid to play, play! Dalton steps around the wire and up to Cody. You work one mean ex, my man. And I thought you'd be bigger. They laugh, embrace. The rest of the band acknowledge Dalton. Cody gropes for a towel to wipe off the beer. Dalton hands it to him. We heard you were coming, man. This toilet's worse than the one we worked in Dayton. She's a mean scene. Blood on the floor every night. Must have offered you some kind of cash. Enough. Bouncer with the weird laugh. He a bone breaker? You mean the big guy? Morgan? Terry Funk? Hall of Famer? Yeah. A fan in full squirm homes in on him. I just love the way you play. Thanks. You sound beautiful. He holds up his hand as if wanting to touch her face. Well, I am. (laughs) Would you mind if... Oh, sure. Go ahead. Instead, he drops his hand to her waist, up and down. One of his routines that never fails. She laughs, goes with it. Dalton starts to ease away. Later, amigo. Dalton? Yeah? I'm glad you're here, man. So let's go ahead and call it there. So that's 11, 10, 11 pages. So that's the first 10 pages of Roadhouse. And boy, oh boy. Uh, do we learn about the atmosphere and tone of the film, of the script from the first ten? Oh yeah, we've got uh, scumbaggery, we've we've got uh, pussy prospectors, violence, um, just so much masculinity and testosterone in here. We definitely know what we're getting into when it comes to Roadhouse. Uh, do we meet our characters? Do we get some character introductions? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Just about all. Uh, of the main hitters here. Uh, we obviously get Dalton. We get Morgan, Terry Fung. Um, we get uh, Trudy and we get Phil Cody, which is a little bit different in the movie. Um, his introduction, he's still in the cage, but uh, Dalton sneaks in there and he gives him the towel. And so it's slightly different in the movie. I think it's better in the movie than what we have right here. And yeah. Roadhouse. Who knew uh, that it would be a very, very good script? You know, we've talked about it before that just because it's, you know, cult favorite, campy, you know, B movie stuff or whatever, the scripts are usually pretty damn solid. And that is the case here. So that is going to do it for the first 10 pages of Roadhouse. Thank you for being here. Please like and subscribe, hit the bell. Uh, Let me know what scripts that you'd like to see covered here on the first 10 pages. Otherwise, that will do it for this episode. Thank you for being here. I will have a new episode soon. Keep writing.